In chapter 19, From Balmoral to the Balkans, in September of 1912, with the Balkan League beginning to assert itself, King George V invited Sazanov to join him and Sir Edward Grey at Balmoral. Sazanov claimed in his memoirs that he spent six days in the Aberdeenshire countryside locked in private talks with the King and Sir Edward Grey in the company of Russian ambassador to Britain, Count Benkendorf, Benkendorf, Benkendorf and Bonar Law, leader of the conservative opposition. The official memoirs of both Gray and Sazanov suggest that virtually no discussion took place on the Balkans crisis, even although it had reached boiling point and war was just about to break out. How strange. Their differing recollections of the private discussions are at serious odds at one key matter, on one key matter. Sazanov, whose correspondence secret elite could not edit in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution, telegraphed the Tsar afterwards to tell him triumphantly, an agreement exists between France and Great Britain, under which, in the event of war with Germany, Great Britain was, has accepted the obligation of bringing assistance to France, not only on sea but on land, by landing troops on the continent. The king touched on the same question, and expressed himself even more strongly than his minister. He said, We shall sink every single German merchant ship we shall get hold of. In fact, Point Care had told Sazanov in confidence about Britain's secret commitment some weeks earlier, but now he had the confirmation he so desperately needed. Balmoral, 1912, offers the perfect example of how the secret elite managed international politics through their agents and how they controlled the official records of these events. The king was asked to invite Sazanov to his Scottish country estate and charmed him with the elegance of royalty. The foreign secretary, diplomats, the leaders of the opposition, and others were in attendance. We do not know what who else visited or stayed over, who dined with the guests and walked or fished or hunted with them. The details that were made public acted as a smokescreen behind which the real politics took place. Nothing that could incriminate was trust was traceable. It was agreed with nods and handshakes. Verbal consent was sufficient. Matters of real importance were concealed from Parliament and the people by sophistry and carefully prepared official records. Judgments were made. Opinions were shared. Strategy was considered and agreed. Sazanov emerged thrilled with the heady intoxication of regal flattery, clearly understanding that war was coming and that Britain would play its part. His excited telegram to the Tsar, quoted in part above, is a reliable account of what he believed he heard. The only questions that remained unanswered were how soon and by what means war against Germany could be induced by way of the Balkans. Gray's dismissive memoirs stated that the main focus at Balmoral was that wearisome subject that wearisome subject, Persia. The subsequent memorandum drawn up by the Foreign Office on the 4th of October 1912 is exactly as Gray claimed, boring, long-winded, and focused on Persia. Afghanistan, consular, consular representation, the Trans-Persian Railway, and border disputes. His silence on the Balkans is deafening. Sazanov spent four consecutive days with the British Foreign Secretary discussing world affairs, and two weeks later the First Balkan War broke out. Yet he claimed that it didn't merit inclusion in their discussions. Elsewhere in his writings, Gray talked about the 
pent-up hatreds of generations that exploded into war in the Balkans. A war he described as just on the grounds that it involved the emancipation of Christian subjects of Turkey. But we are asked to believe that nothing else said about it at Balmoral. But we are asked to believe that nothing was said about it at Balmoral. This was, of course, a deliberate deception. Sazanov's account of Balmoral mentions the impetuous outbursts of the Balkan states as if he had no prior knowledge of their intentions. He communicated regularly with his Volsky about the war that he knew was about to break out. They had planned it. Serbia and Bulgaria were, after all, obliged to hold off until Russia gave no gave the go ahead. Sazanov was not a well man. His health had been an ongoing problem for him. He was in awe of Sir Edward Grey, a politician at the pinnacle of his powers. Sazanov and his Volsky owed their very position to the influence that Grey represented. The secret elite set their agenda. Sazanov and Gray most certainly discussed the Balkans. In a private letter to the British ambassador to Russia, written on the 21st of October 1912, a matter of one month later, Gray confided, The fact is that he, Sazanov, was at Balmoral, which cons- much concerned at the blaze he had kindled in the Balkans by fomenting an alliance of the Balkan states. So much for the integrity of his memoirs. Sir Edward Grey clearly wanted to keep secret any record of the Balkans' discussion. But diplomatic exchanges have made, have since exposed his deception. The Russian press was mightily unimpressed by Sazanov's visit to Britain. That resulted in no visible support for their Balkans' ambition and the Foreign Office was alerted to the disappointment this caused. British Ambassador Sir George Buchanan sent Gray a dispatch quoting an article in Novo Verema that questioned the value to Russia of having an entente with England, written by Stolypin, brother of the recently assassinated Russian Prime Minister, It captured the very truth that the secret elite sought to bury. Buchanan paraphrased Dolipin's argument. In a war with Germany, England would endeavor to drag Russia and France into the struggle, which would be one of existence for her, but which cannot fail to to be prejudicial, prejudicial to Russia's interests. Dolipin was one of the numbers was one of a number of Russians who recognized that there was a fundamental divergence of interest between Britain and the Tsar's empire. At every turn, Britain was opposed to Russian designs in Persia, Afghanistan, the Straits, and the Balkans, and Stolypin was absolutely correct in his warnings that Britain intended to drag Russia into a war with Germany. Every overture to Russia since 1905 was occasioned by its value in an all-out war with Germany. Press rumblings and reported grievances grievances in Russia over British interests in the Balkans and Persia might well have disturbed the secret elite's grand plan. So the royal card was played. The king was asked to write privately and personally to the Tsar to reassure him that Sazanov's visit had been entirely satisfactory, that the most friendly and intimate relations between the two countries should be maintained, and to express in hope to express the hope that their cordial and frank links would continue. Sir Arthur Nicholson, Gray's minder in the Foreign Office, more or less dedicated the King's letter, stating that the Tsar was the all important factor in the autocratic Russian Empire. Keeping the Tsar on side was absolutely vital to the secret elite, no matter how the Balkan disturbances ended. 
Izvolsky had known about the plans for, for war in the Balkans some 18 months before the outbreak. He was, after all, the first to encourage the small nations to come together in the formal Balkan League. His fingerprints were all over a treaty that bound Serbia and Bulgaria to declare war against Turkey. Its secret clauses gave Russia the role to, of arbitrator, arbiter to decide what when that war would begin, could begin and insisted that the Balkan League accepted Russia's accept Russian decisions on any points of disagreement. Isvolsky and Sazanov had ownership of, of this attack on Turkey, but their orders came from London. The final decision always lays in London. Myths in history tend to become self-perpetuating. One such myth that grew into accepted popular culture in the early 20th century was that Russia had a profound and binding right to protect Serbia, as if there was some deep Slavic bond between them. Serbia was not wholly a Slav nation, nor was Russia. There was no long-standing affection between the two. When one cut out used the other to advantage, they did so. At all other times, each intrigued for, for or against the war, Izvolsky had proved how little Serbia meant to Russia in 1908 when he agreed that Austria could annex Bosnia-Herzegovina. She never forgave the Austrian betrayal as he saw it. He never forgave the Austrian betrayal as he saw it and carried a personal grudge to his grave but it suited Russian self-importance to perpetuate the pretense of being the protector of all Slavic people. There were large numbers of Slavs in Bosnia who considered themselves kin to their Siberian cousins. They constituted a deep reserve of disaffection from which disruption against Austria could be stirred. Russia had funded the murder of one Serbian dynasty more inclined to Austria that of King Alexander and Queen Draga, and replaced it with another that was undeviant, undeviantatingly, was undeviantatingly sympathetic to Russia. Russia abused her influence with Serbia to keep constant pressure on Austria-Hungary. The continual and wearing disruptions began to annoy Austria so much that the choice was either endless costly bickering or a sharp decisive war to punish Serbia. As Edith Durnham observed, Austria, exasperated by the repeated outrage of the Serbs and aware of the activity of Hartwig in Belgrade, realized that she was marked down as Russia's next victim on the proscri proscribed list and that the hour was arriving when she must kill or be killed. Wars do not just happen. Small skirmishes do. Wars have to be financed in advance and repaid with interest. When the Paris banks showed a studied lack of interest in Bulgaria's approach to borrow heavily for the war against Turkey, it was Izvolsky who ensured that they got what they needed. Serious pressure was applied to French bankers in favor of Bulgaria, the Minister of Finance. Tudorov met personally with Izvolsky in Paris in June of 1912 to thank him and update him on Bulgarian plans, but Izvolsky was the procurer, not the source. He had access to other backers, and they were not to be found in Russia. Two distinct conflicts took place in the southeastern flank of Europe in 1912 and 1913. The first was concerted attack on Turkey by the combined nations of the Balkan League. In October of 1912, Serbia, Bulgaria, Montenegro, and Greece, secretly backed by England, declared war on Turkey and stripped her of most of her European possessions. Turkey was the first target, but the Balkan League was also directed against Austria. Without doubt, the League had a twofold agenda had a twofold agenda. They believed that the simplest and best solution would be the simultaneous breakup of Turkey 
and the downfall of Austria-Hungary. Deals were agreed. Serbia can make Bosnia-Herzegovina, Romania, and Romania would have Transylvania, and Bulgaria would be free from Roman interference, Romanian interference. The First Balkan War was short, not particularly sweet and humiliating for Turkey. An all-out conflict that might draw in the great powers never materialized. Austria did not intervene, and Kaiser Wilhelm made it clear that he would, under no circumstances, be prepared to go to war with Russia or France on account of the Balkan nations. This undoubtedly disappointed those who hoped, indeed planned, that it would lead to a, a greater European war. On the 25th of November 1912, the German government called for a joint settlement of the crisis and an ambassador's conference was held in London in December. Sir Edward Grey claimed to have taken no part in the discussion as they did not touch British interests and were not our affair. As we've already shown, the exact opposite was the case. Like Plutonius Pil Pilat, pl like Pluto, like Pontius Pilat, Gray had had a propensity to wash his hands of responsibilities for difficult decisions. In fact, the London Conference brokered only a temporary truce. Nothing was permanently resolved. The only the one thing that could be guaranteed was continual bickering and aggressive anti-Austrian antagonism emanating through Serbia. George Lewis, while while still the French ambassador at St. Petersburg, had no doubt that Hartwig was stirring Serbia against Austria. He reported that Hartwig had incautiously incautiously remarked that the affair of Turkey is settled. Now it is the turn of Austria that pl that the plan was set is undeniable. But Ambassador Lewis was not a player in the secret elite's grand scheme. He was removed for his troubles. Despite the many pressing demands at home, the secret elite had stepped up their preparations all through the period of Balkan strife. December 5th, 1912. As Volsky reported, Lately in the most rigorous secrecy, the chief of the English general staff, General Wilson, arrived in France, and on this occasion various complimentary details have been elaborated. Not only military, but other representatives of the French government have participated in this work. Two weeks later, Zvolsky telegraphed Sazanov, warning that the Austrian cabinet might make a critical move, causing a Russian response, which in turn would inevitably and automatically drag first Germany and then France into war. Poincare, Poincare viewed the possibility with perfect calm, aware of French obligations under the alliance, and firmly resolved to act. All the necessary steps had been taken. Mobilization on the frontier had been examined. War material was in place and processes and procedures for going, for going to war with Germany were understood and agreed with the military command. Raymond Poincaré was, was on the point of introducing his three-year army bill to increase the time enlisted men, enlisted men would stay in the forces from two years to three, it rapidly led to a huge increase in French military manpower. Edward Grey secretly assured Poincaré that Britain would support France and Russia as an obligation of honor should the Balkans' trouble lead to a European war. Sazanov telegraphed Izvolsky asking him to reassure the French to reassure the French that Russia was too ready. He rebutted claims that Russia had done nothing to build up its forces. In fact, some 350,000 reservists reservist 
had been retained within the colors. In addition, 80 million rubles had been allocated for extraordinary army requirements at, and for the Balkan fleet. While some of the divisions in Kiev command, Kiev command had been brought closer to the Austrian frontier, To all intents and purposes, Britain, Russia, and France were in a state of alert, checking on one another's readiness. The question being asked in the dark corridors of power in London, Paris, St. Petersburg, and across other European capitals was, is a general war going to break out this time? French and Russian military preparations continued unabated. All that was needed was was in sa was a satisfactory incident in the Balkans to precipitate the war. The French people were subjected to a campaign of anti-German and anti-Austrian propaganda in the papers, whose editors and writers were being bribed by funds obtained by Zvolsky. Newspapers in the UK had spent the better part of a decade softening up the British public for war. Behind the mask of indifference to the Balkans, the warmongerings in Britain were almost ready. Perhaps the most telling evidence that Europe stood on the brink in 1912 comes from Belgium. In November of 1912, the Parliament in Brussels held a secret seating, sitting at the instance of King Albert to consider urgent pre precautionary measures. The king disclosed to a hushed chamber that he had evidence that Belgium was in dire and imminent danger, a drastic and far-reaching military program that had been first advocated by his predecessor, Leopold II, some 30 years previously, was adopted immediately. The strength of the Belgian army was raised to 150,000 men in the field, with 60,000 in auxiliary services and 130,000 allocated to defensive garrisons, 340,000 men in total. It was an enormous expansion of armed forces in a supposedly neutral nation of 7,500,000 people. What was the nature of King Albert's evidence? Where did it come from and why was it given directly to him? These were not the normal channels through the, which secrets were passed. The accepted protocol was for kings and royalty to liaise, to liaise with each other, with each other while government ministers shared and exchanged views, exchanged news and views. So who alerted the king? The only reason he would have taken such exceptional action was a warning that European war was imminent. A second cousin, the late, a second cousin to the late King Edwards, Albert, had an absolute trust in the British royal family, though no evidence could be produced to prove that this was his royal source, none would have had more impact. There was another aspect to the, build, to the Belgian sense of impending crisis. According to evidence later published in New York, the Belgians were advised in November of 1912 by the British military that as soon as the European war broke out, 160,000 men would be transported to Belgium and northern France with or without the permission of the Belgian government. Bear this in mind, with or without the permission of the Belgian government, the British planned to be in Belgium when war broke out. The sense of ongoing crisis was fully justified because the Balkans were far from settled. Following the first Balkan, Balkan War, Bulgaria claimed the rights to territory she had taken from Turkey. Her claim rested upon the pre-war treaty agreed with Serbia by which 
definite portions of the captured land were to be allocated to each country. Serbia, disgruntled at having been ordered by the great powers to vacate areas allocated to her in, in Albania, demanded a portion of the land she had previously agreed should go to Bulgaria. Bloated by her by early success, Serbia strutted threateningly like the young thug who knows he can flex his muscles against a bigger boy because he has the protection of an older bully. Serbia relied on the promised support of Russia to push for more than she had already gained. Russia was their provider, guarantor, and arbiter. arbiter. Bulgaria, having suffered by far the greatest number of war casualties, refused and insisted that the terms of the treaty be adhered to. She called on Russia to fulfill her agreed role as arbiter. Much to the anger and resentment of the Bulgarian government, the Tsar responded by paying an overtly friendly visit to Bulgaria's old adversary, Romania. To make matters worse, Russia backed the Serbian claims that in so doing forfeited Bulgaria's friendship. The league was split irrevocably, skirmishes between Bulgarian and Serbian troops on their communal board, border led to the Second Balkan War in, the, in June of 1913. Serbian forces, aided by Romania and Greece, committed terrible atrocities as they penetrated deep into Bulgaria. Russia, France, and Britain. Russia, France, Britain looked on passively as Bulgaria was soundly beaten. The Turks took the opportunity to invade Bulgaria and snatch back some of their territories ceded after the First Balkan War. The Treaty of Bucharest on the 10th of August 1913 brought a second temporary peace to the region but at considerable cost to the Bulgar to Bulgaria, which had lost most of the territorial gains made from the First Balkan War. In stark contrast, Serbia doubled its territory and now posed as even greater threat an even greater threat to Austria Hungary, both externally and encouragingly the sizable Serbian and encouraging the sizable Serbian minority within the dual monarchy. To demand, to demand its independence. There was a feral nature to Balkan warfare that accepted atrocities as the natural course of events. The Serbian practice of decapitating the dead or captured enemy and impaling, and impaling their heads on poles was positively medieval. The extermination of entire villages or the merciless bay bayonetting of women and children was commonplace. The Russian press and, uh, and that of Western Europe was excorci excoriated by Trotsky, Durnham, and others for its conspiracy of silence about the atrocities being committed by the Slavs of the Balkans against the Turks. Disgusted by the behavior of the Serbian army, Edith Durham left the Balkans for London and rushed to the foreign office to plead the case for a Muslim population that was being systematically subjected to humiliation, torture, and death. Muslims were being coerced into conversion to Christianity. She recorded that each day civilians were taken from their village and summarily executed. Writing, as the victims fell, the earth was shoveled over them, whether living or dead. Men were plunged into ice-cold rivers and then half-roasted until they cried for mercy. The conversion to Christianity was the price. Medieval barbarity was reintroduced with a vengeance. The, Carne the Carnegie Commission that was later set up to investigate such crimes against humanity made clear that the accusations were, were true. These atrocities were planned and executed by the Ser Serbian Black Hand. Durham was fobbed off by the Foreign Office, 
the British establishment did not want to know. Sir Edward Grey had deemed it a just war on the grounds that Christians could now be protected from the Ottomans. In truth, the secret elite needed the murderous black hand and their leader, Colonel Apis, for a hugely important task. In the summer of 1913, Serbian troops reoccupied Albanian territory, even though it was supposed to be protected by the great powers. Yet more atrocities followed. Belgium was approached directly by the Austrians to use its influence as a matter of urgency to effect a Serbian withdrawal. Sir Edward Grey happened to be out of town for the weekend, and his undersecretary, Sir Eric Crow, declined to make declined to take action on the grounds that she did not think that Grey would approve of demand for immediate withdrawal by the Serbs. Austria-Hungary was seething and prepared to send aid to Albania. A major European war became more likely by the hour. Every tele every emergency telegram was sent by the Russian army from the Tsar stating that an order of, modif of mobilization in the Western military consumed command. An emergency telegram was sent to the Russian army from the Tsar stating that an order of mob mobilization in the Western military command caused by any political complication on the Western frontier was to be treated as an order for the sort of hostilities against Austria and, Hung and Germany. In other words, the military command had to treat an order for general mobilization emanating from St. Petersburg as an indication that the talking had ended. Such a mobilization meant war, and it meant war with Austria and Germany. The temperature kept rising as the pent-up frustrations in the Balkan pressure cooker rose to a bursting point. European war was only averted in 1913 because Russia ordered Serbia to move back from the brink after the Austrians served an ultimatum on Belgrade. The Serbians were furious but had no option but to comply. Why did Russia take this decision in 1913 but respond to a similar situation in 1914 with, with the full mobilization of its armies? Was it a function of their state of readiness for war? Possibly. But as far as the secret elite was concerned, the raison d'etre for the Balkan crisis was to get Austria to react to severe provocations in order to draw Germany in. This was not at its core about Austria. It was about Germany. It had always been about Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm would not be drawn. He was not willing to support an Austrian onslaught against Serbia. Instead, he consistently focused on low-risk diplomatic solutions to the extent that there was a considerable frustration in Vienna at his personal at his apparent instability to understand the serious threat that Austria believed she faced from her enemies. In Belgrade, Contrary to the ubiquitous image of the warmongering, Kaiser Bill, so beloved, so beloved of British, British propaganda, Wilhelm urged Austria to make concessions to the Serbs and seek peaceful coexistence. When Germany pressured Austria to accept the diplomatic resolution, the Continental War in 1913 became possible. Germany had to be at the frontier, had to be seen as the aggressor. And what had the secret elite learned from all of this? Learned from it all? It was clear that the British public had little stomach for war over a Balkan nation. With so many local distractions, Ireland, the so forget, the so forget demands, strikes and social unrest. Public interest in the Balkans was virtually non-existent and sympathy for Russia was at a low ebb.
Many members of parliament, especially the liberal radicals, spoke despairingly, despairingly about the Tsarist regime with its pogroms and repressions. Serbia, Bosnia, Slavic nationalism. These were not the concerns of the British people in 1913. If a war did break out, hell mend them. Hell mend, hell mend them was the attitude. It had nothing to do with Britain, had it not only had more not only had more work to be done to fully prepare the British people for war, but Germany wasn't taking the bait. The secret elite understood the history of genocide and massacres in the Balkans and had a grasp of undetermined disputes disputes that could be put to great advantage great advantage. They could see that Austria was bristling with frustration. Its national pride, its international standing, its very patient its very patient was being undermined by Serbian aggression. Austria laid like a coiled spring that Serbia continued to prick and prod in the in the hope and expectation that one day it would explode. And when that happened, Germany would be pitched into action, surely. Summary for Chapter 19, From Balmoral to the Balkans. Sazanov met with Sir Edward Grey and George, King George V at Balmoral in 1912. Both he and Grey claimed not to have discussed the Balkans, the lies and disinformation that stemmed from those four days of meeting offer offer a perfect example of how the secret league covered their real business. Sazanov reported to the Tsar that Britain was secretly committed to support France in a war with Germany both by land and sea. Secretly backed by England, the Balkan League attacked and humiliated Turkey. All-out war was avoided because the Kaiser would not contemplate it and call for a peace conference in London. The Second Balkan War targeted Bulgaria and Austri Austria's allies. The secret elite chose to ignore the evidence of brutal massacres by the Serbian troops. Austria, Austria was consistently undermined and challenged by Serbia. The treatment of Albania was deplorable, but Germany refused to let her allies be suckered into war because of Serbia. Yet again, the Kaiser would not be drawn into the conflict. He favored diplomatic solutions. The lesson learned was this. Austria was seething at the abuse she suffered from Serbia and was at her wit's end. Austria would be the Achilles heel.